both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and we want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are crucial to our success. So I'm thrilled to welcome our presenters today, but first I want to turn things, I want to switch slides and um, turn things over to my colleague, uh, Chayla Weber, who will say just a few words of introduction. Take it away, Chayla. Thanks, Marilee, uh, and good morning from Seattle, uh, where it's still morning. Um, so, hi, I'm Chayla Scott Weber. I'm a senior program officer here with the OCLC Research Library Partnership. Um, my work in, uh, with the RLP focuses on supporting learning and research related to archive special and distinctive collections. Um, so, I'm excited to be here with you all today. Um, so. OCLC research has a long history of work in the area of archives and special collections um, because we, we recognize special collections as, the, as an important site of knowledge creation, whether through teaching or learning or research that's made possible by the library's commitment to, to the stewardship of their distinctive collections. And we also know that the unique nature of material in special collections can make scaling work on these uh, materials a challenge, and so we try to identify areas of common need um, to help libraries make the most of their investment in special collections. In October of 2018, we released the Research and Learning Agenda for Archive Special and Distinctive Collections, um, created through a participatory process with the Archives and Special Collections community. It really articulates some shared challenges and opportunities for research libraries uh, in this sphere and suggests approaches on working on them together. And it is now guiding our work in this area. One of the key priorities identified through the, the agenda process was, was aligning special collections with the priorities of the larger research library and serving the core teaching mission, especially in our academic library partner organizations is one of the clearest ways to do this. Um, the last decade or so has been a really exciting time in the evolution of approach to teaching with primary sources with the ACRL SAA guidelines for primary source literacy and a really robust professional sort of literature and conversation and practice around teaching with primary sources. Um, so I was particularly excited that Laura and Chloe agreed to present today because I think the research done in this Ithaca study can really inform that continuing evolution in, in, uh, in a rigorous way, in the rigorous way that research can, um, and also be really useful to us in advocating for the programmatic needs of our teaching programs. Um, so, so I'm excited to hear what they learned from participating in the study and how that's influenced their approach uh, to their teaching. So. With that, I will very happily turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our Works in Progress webinar, Partnerships, Pedagogy, and Primary Sources, Strategies for Working with Faculty to Engage Students with Primary Sources. My name is Chloe Gerson, and I am the Reference and Instruction Archivist at the Robert D. Farber University Archives and Special Collections. I support research in a variety of different disciplines for our students and faculty, as well as researchers from around the world. Laura and I met nearly seven years ago when we both came to Brandeis. We started teaching together one day and never stopped. I'm Laura Hibbler. I'm the Associate University Librarian for Research and Instruction at Brandeis, and I also serve as the Library Liaison to the History Department and to the Department of African and African American Studies, and I feel very lucky that uh, the faculty in both of those departments are really eager to collaborate with librarians and archivists, leading to all sorts of great partnerships with Chloe. And we share a love of teaching with primary sources. So before we get started, I wanted to just share a little background information with all of you. Brandeis University was founded in 1948. We are a non-sectarian, Jewish-sponsored private research uni university located about nine miles west of Boston. 
As of fall 2019, we had more than 3,600 undergrads with 43 majors and 47 minors. The Brandeis Goldfarb Library houses the Archives and Special Collections Department. Within the library and archives, most of the subject librarians and archivists all have some kind of teaching responsibility included in their job descriptions. We have monthly teaching discussion meetings where we come together to share details about classes we have taught and upcoming sessions, and to toss around ideas for potential collaborations with different team members, including those from our Maker Lab and our Media Lab. Major collecting strengths in the archives include university history, Judaica, Jewish feminism, Shakespeare, 19th and 20th century literature, and the history of science. At the end of the fall 2018 semester, Ithaca SNR invited universities from across the US and the UK to take part in a research study that was focused on identifying ways to support faculty teaching with undergraduates from primary sources. Each research team at the institutions would complete training in qualitative research methods and then interview a group of faculty at their own institutions. After the interviews, each team would write a local report about their findings, which Ithaca would then use to create an overall report analyzing the results of the entire project. Our library director asked us to conduct the study for Brandeis, and because of our love of teaching with primary sources, we jumped at the chance. All faculty that were selected to participate in the study taught in departments and programs in the humanities and social sciences. Faculty held the ranks of lecturer, assistant professor, professor, and associate professor, with years of experience teaching ranging from early career to several decades in the classroom. Faculty selected had all taught with primary sources in some way before, either in class sessions with the archives, or were their subject librarians using digitized primary source databases, or both. All of the interviews were conducted during the fall of 2019. At the start of each interview, faculty were asked to sign a consent form. Each interview was transcribed, anonymized, and coded during spring 2020, during the pandemic. Our local report was written during the spring and summer of 2020, and the final Ithaca report was released in March 2021. So I'll talk a little bit about some of our findings. We learned many different about many different aspects of faculty members te experiences teaching with primary sources. And we're going to just focus on three themes today. Uh, and these themes are how faculty learned to teach undergraduates with primary sources. Faculty approaches to defining primary sources for their students. And representation of marginalized voices within readily available primary sources. So the quotes on this first responses that we heard from faculty when we asked how they had learned to teach with primary sources. Multiple faculty members noted that they had not received any formal training in teaching at all. While some faculty noted that their graduate schools had offered pedagogical training, most felt that their development as teachers had really been a result of their own experiences teaching in the classroom and learning from their experiences. For example, an American Studies professor shared that she had learned by from making mistakes. Several other faculty used phrases such as trial and error and trial by fire to describe how they had learned to teach with primary sources. Without formal training in pedagogy, they tried different approaches in the classroom and learned from their own teaching experiences over time. Others described how they had benefited from observing the effective practices of other faculty. For example, one professor in African and African American studies explained that she was really inspired by the way she was taught. So she remembered faculty who had assigned primary sources every week as readings for their classes. And she described this approach as a really phenomenal way, especially for students, and especially when it comes to history, to just understand how people living in the past thought about certain things and to get that firsthand account that is much richer than what you might find in a textbook. Many faculty also uh, talked about partnering with librarians and archivists, and we fully acknowledge, of course, that the faculty who participated in these interviews 
might not be representative of all faculty because they had agreed to participate in the interviews and probably that is an indication that they were more open and, um, and uh, receptive to collaborating with archivists and librarians. However, we felt that the productive uh, experiences that they described uh, would be really helpful to think about and uh, thinking about ways to help faculty explore new pedagogical approaches to teaching with primary sources. The faculty members who had taught with librarians and archivists shared that those classes had enriched their courses overall and that students really enjoyed these sessions. Some faculty said that they also, they talked about learning a lot from the sessions themselves. Uh, they might have learned about various databases that the library subscribes to that they'd been unaware of. Uh, and not only learning about resources, they talked about uh, learning about different approaches to engaging students with primary sources. One faculty member reflected on their teaching experience with both a librarian and an archivist and said, they're not only interested in just doing their dog and pony show, but they're really interested in the larger context of where it fits and what the students are doing. And we thought this was a really great quote that got to that idea that we're not just introducing resources, but really, uh, and, and search strategies, but that we're really thinking about the overall learning goals of the class and truly partnering with faculty to help uh, Faculty also described positive collaborations in the design of sessions and assignments. Uh, as one example, a legal studies professor shared her experience working with an archivist to craft a, craft a class. She noted that the archivist does a fantastic exercise with primary sources that inspires students to tell a story based on archival material. And I thought it was an excellent way to hammer the point home to my students about how stories are pieced together through the accumulation of various primary sources. Another faculty member talked about working with a librarian to help figure out a way to structure an assignment that involved working with a database of oral histories. And she noted that the papers that students submitted uh, at the end of when they completed the assignment were the best papers that she had read as a faculty member. So these examples illustrate ways that librarians and archivists can develop pedagogical techniques together, which may be particularly helpful for faculty who, of course, often haven't had many opportunities to learn how to teach with primary sources. When we asked faculty about uh, whether they define primary sources for their students, they offered a wide range of thoughts. Uh, very often uh, participants responded that they do not uh, define primary sources for their students. As one explained, sometimes I assume they know. I hope they learn that in high school. And it's certainly understandable that with a limited number of class sessions during the semester, faculty might find it challenging to dedicate course time to this topic. Uh, but in answering this question, uh, some one faculty member did seem to start reflecting on whether he maybe should start to define primary sources for his students. He said, I don't, no I should. Most of them know the difference between a primary and a secondary source, but I've never devoted a class session to sources, which I probably should, maybe I should. Other faculty described coming to that realization that they, it would be valuable to define primary sources for their students. Uh, they had come to that realization during their teaching careers. Uh, so for example, a historian noted that early in her teaching career, she had assumed that students had learned this information in high school. Initially, she worried, am I babying them? Do I sound condescending if I talk about the definition of primary sources with my students? However, as she progressed in her career, she realized that there was a lot of value in discussing the definition of primary sources and really reinforcing the concept. She said, a lot of them, even if they've learned it, have forgotten it. Some of them may not have been exposed at all. And another professor reflected on her own undergraduate education. She noted that she herself as an undergraduate had really had limited exposure to primary sources and uh, that many of her students might be in the same boat. And she said, I actually think undergraduates. It might be assumed so often that undergraduates come in knowing what a primary source is, but depending on the resources available at their high school or other factors, such as a student's course of study, undergraduates might really come in with vastly different levels of exposure to primary sources. 
sources. In addition to conveying the definition of primary sources, several faculty also described the importance of introducing students to the many forms that primary sources can take. When asked to provide examples of primary sources, undergraduate students' uh, first thoughts are often letters and diaries, and which of course are great primary sources, but they might overlook the rich variety of historical materials that could be available on a topic. As an African American studies professor pointed out, people often assume that primary sources are text-based. And uh, she talked about dislodging the, no the notion that a primary source has to be written. A historian shared similar thoughts about exposing students to a range of primary sources and doing things like encouraging students to think about how a source like a woodblock print could be a really valuable source for their project. And in discussing how they teach primary teach students about primary sources, many faculty also emphasize the importance of guiding students and how to engage with primary sources. They noted that students might not have had experience with the reading and evaluating primary sources. And our third theme is around representation of marginalized voices. In discussing how they selected primary sources for their classes, several faculty also discussed their efforts toward representing marginalized voices. Faculty shared that the most readily available primary sources often focus on the experiences and the perspectives of people in positions of relative power, such as men instead of women, individuals who are literate, historical figures who wrote in English, and several faculty described their efforts toward uh, including sources that reflect a wider range of perspectives and experiences, including materials produced by communities of color. And of course, the availability of subscription based digitized primary sources can often be an obstacle for faculty and students at any university. These materials or these databases are often quite expensive. Uh, but the challenge is even more pronounced for those who are working with primary sources from outside of the United States and Europe, because so many of these uh, digitized collections do focus on the United States and Europe. Uh, a professor discovered that our university had really limited access to primary sources from African nations that she wanted to use in her teaching. Uh, and as a specific example, she discussed challenges with finding Nollywood films for a class that she taught. And we have a quote from this professor here. So, um, you know, in this case, she's looking for things that uh, uh, are, were produced relatively recently, but uh, are hard to find students toward. Uh, but despite these challenges, faculty really emphasizes the value of including primary sources written by marginalized individuals. One faculty member described the pedagogical value stating, I think these kinds of primary sources are absolutely critical. And issues of representation really offer opportunities for high level of engagement with student, with, with, uh, for stu uh, student engagement with uh, research projects. One faculty member described an assignment that she described as having diversity and inclusion as an umbrella. And she, uh, students explored archival materials related to first generation students at Brandeis, as well as uh, topics related to accessibility at Brandeis. And she found students were really able to flesh out topics that connected to issues of importance in their own lives and developed really rich final research projects, such as a documentary film. Each of these themes that um, I've discussed here today will be, uh, have been a focus for us as we've partnered with faculty and developed teaching opportunities over the past year, even during the pandemic. And Chloe is gonna provide some examples of uh, collaborations with classes. So during the pandemic, we've had to come up with new ways to collaborate with each other and with our faculty. One of the ways we did this in the archives was to offer a set of three different workshops throughout the year. One, of the his, one on the history of the university using historical images from our university photography collections, like the one featured here. One on how to do in-depth archival research and one about teaching with primary sources that was offered to faculty. The teaching workshop was offered in January before the semester began and will be offered again in May. We plan to offer it at the beginning and end of every semester in the future. The history workshop has been offered every month since August and a range of incoming and current students, parents of students, alumni and staff have attended. We were also asked to offer the history workshop to the development department after one of their staff members came to one of our sessions during the fall semester. 
The in-depth research workshop has attracted both undergrads and grad students and is offered every other month. Almost half of the faculty that attended our first teaching workshop had taught physical classes in the archives, and one of the professors had never taught with us before but was a participant in the Ithaca study. We also had two faculty members who have never taught with us before make plans for classes this semester. So the following slides are examples of classes that Laura and I have taught that we're going to expand on. Our history faculty member had shown interest in the past about having a class session in the archives, but had never taken the next step. The class session that I taught for her was meant to be an exploratory dive into finding aids and their creation. And building on our Ithaca theme about supporting faculty and defining primary sources and to establish a solid understanding of them and how to use them. The class was taught on Zoom and consisted of three students and the professor. We started the class off by talking about primary sources in general so that we could establish a working definition of the term. I have found that most students have a general idea of what primary sources are, but tend to get a little lost when they have to actually apply the definition to, term, to items. As a way to create a definition, I will ask the students to give me an example of a primary source. And Laura has also done this by reviewing the definition with her students and then asking them to write in examples on the chat so that students can learn from one another but in a more low stakes environment. By creating a working definition of primary sources together, I can assess their overall knowledge of the term and help create somewhat of a, le a level playing field when it comes to working with them. As an icebreaker following our class discussion, students made their own archival collections by listing 10 items that would tell the story of their own lives. After the icebreaker, I gave a presentation on archives and how to locate and read finding aids in our collection. The second half of the class was an active learning exercise. Each student took their list of 10 things that they made earlier on a Google Doc and shared it with another person in their class. So I actually went through during class and cut and pasted their list together. They then had the next 20 minutes to make a finding aid using the 20 items from both of their lists combined with a few rules. They had to make at least five series and at least two items had to be in each series and no series could be called miscellaneous or a particular format like photographs. Once they had their series, they had to title their collection and write a scope and contents note. After 20 minutes, each student and the professor who had opted to participate in the exercise presented their finding aid and talked about the process of making their collection. During our reflection at the end of the class, we talked about how collections are put together and created how the things in a collection just seem like a random array of stuff at first glance. But when you think about them and get to know the creator, they no longer look random, but fit and make sense. The professor shared with me that I had exceeded her expectations of what she thought we could ever have accomplished in an online class session with the archives. So this slide is an example of one of the finding aids the students created. This slide is from a class we taught with a professor from the anthropology department who had been hired during the pandemic from the UK and due to all the travel restrictions is actually teaching the semester from the UK. She has not been able to come to campus yet. So this class was on Zoom too. This professor stayed on for an extra 30 minutes after the teaching workshop to begin planning her class. In this online class session, which I co-taught with one of our other archivists, we had the students work in groups of three in breakout rooms to interrogate a variety of items from different collections available digitally using the 5W and an H journalism format. This class brings in our Ithaca theme related to learning to teach with primary sources by partnering with a faculty member to help teach students how to use primary sources and become experts on them in order to present to their peers. Students were asked to think about the collections in regard to their greater social context. Why are these items socially interesting or important? The breakout room function replicates group work in a traditional classroom setting because students get their own personal quiet space to work in as a group. This function also allows the instructors to pop in and out of the rooms to check in with students about questions or to offer help. The students were asked to take their notes on a slide made from a Google slide deck that was created in advance. 
The slides were also used as a way for students to present their items and share out about them to the rest of the class. The Google Slide Deck, which is actually an idea I adapted from Laura, is a great tool to use during class. I can make them ahead of time and label them with the group numbers. This type of presentation style share out allows students to become experts on their items and creates a sense of ownership and pride in the materials while simultaneously instilling confidence and their ability to work with them. The presentations also act as my assessment for the class. Did they understand the assignment? Were they able to identify and explore the materials in a way that made sense for their class? What kinds of questions were they left with? And this is also my opportunity to offer feedback and praise of their work. The presentations can also encourage a larger group discussion and give students more exposure to and experience with public speaking. <clears throat> this slide shows some of the completed slide deck that the students created. So as you can see, students actually added visuals from the collections to their slide, which was not actually a requirement. But since the students knew they would be presenting something, they treated it as such, which I found really interesting. So using the slide deck is a very adaptable and can be used in any type of class. My last class example is actually a collaboration with one of our subject librarians. One of our sociology professors had assigned her students a paper that required them to use primary sources from the university archives collections. Preferably ones that had already been digitized, like the school newspapers, online exhibits, and primary source databases. She requested an asynchronous video and a class guide listing all the resources available to her students that she could post on the course management page so that students could review them at their leisure. Similar to the anthropology class, this is another example of our Ithaca theme related to partnering with a professor to support teaching students how to find and use primary sources to use them in a research assignment. We decided to make the video by doing live searching demonstrations in a few different databases, including our own institutional repository, so that students could see ways to troubleshoot searching issues and give tips on how to use the different databases based on actual searches we were doing in real time. Our video was about 45 minutes long and was captioned and editing, edited sorry, using the Echo 360 lecture capture system. This was my first asynchronous video, and it was really exciting to be able to collaborate with the subject librarians in this way. We have received good feedback from the students about both the course guide and the video, and their paper is actually due today. All right, so I'll be giving a few examples now. Uh, from our Ithaca findings, we knew that faculty, like we've talked about, often aren't taught how to teach with primary sources and also that they're really looking for ways to recreate for their students that experience of working in an archive and developing original research questions. Uh, and several years ago, Chloe and I had uh, come, had learned about the question formulation technique from our director of center of the Center for Teaching and Learning here at Brandeis. Uh, the question formulation technique is often shortened to QFT, and uh, we it was developed by Dan Rothstein and Luce Santana. They've written about it in their book, Make Just One Change, Teach Students How to Ask Their Own Questions. And this is one of the best-selling titles from Harvard Education Press. Santana and Rothstein are also the co-directors of the Right Question Institute, and uh, which provides access to many QFT materials on their site. And today we'll really just be giving a brief overview of the QFT, but uh, we've given entire presentations on the QFT before. So Chloe and I love this teaching technique and we're happy to talk more about it uh, in the question and answer portion or after today. And um, at the end of our slides, uh, we have some uh, citations for folks who might wanna follow up and read more from about the QFT. Uh, so it's basically a simple process that helps students generate their own questions and improve upon those questions. Rostine and Santana have found that students who learn to ask their own questions learn more and they're more engaged with their learning. The technique is seven steps and it begins with a question focus or Q focus, which could be a topic or a picture that's meant to serve as a springboard for generating and improving upon questions. 
uh, Chloe and I had used the, Q the QFT in classes before the pandemic started um, and in-person classes. Uh, we would divide a class into groups and each group would be given a folder from an archival collection. We, we've adapted the QFT a little bit to work with archival materials since it would take a little bit longer to go through for instance. Uh, so we give the, the each group about 10 minutes to look through their folder, and then we step through the question formulation technique. And it's really uh, neat to see uh, students develop a list of questions. Oftentimes they start off with some really good questions that they would need to answer just about sort of sourcing the documents. And then they progress to pretty sophisticated research questions uh, that they would be really interested in pursuing. And as we've moved to online teaching, it's of course a little bit harder to recreate this uh, exact experience. But what I um, try to do in class sessions is really have that question generation at the core of what we do. So as one example with a class I taught just last week, uh, I the I had the class um, and the instructor and I all watch a oral history video. It was about four minutes. It was an interview with an African American physician discussing uh, his work uh, integrating hospitals in Chicago in the early 1950s. So as we all watched this video together it, on Zoom, uh, I had asked the students to be uh, typing research potential research questions into the chat and students were really coming up with really great questions that uh, maybe wouldn't end up being a final research question, but they were getting them thinking about asking questions constantly uh, connecting to the larger historical context and to their own interests. And uh, after we had watched the video as a class, we had this list of questions that students had generated and also uh, the teaching assistant for the class, a graduate student, and the faculty member and I each sort of modeled how we, as we'd watched the, the video, had been thinking of potential research questions as well. Uh, the next, uh, the next example I have here, I realize is not the most beautiful slide, but uh, it is very authentic. Uh, so I have used the Google slides and teaching. I actually used Google slides and teaching pre pandemic too, uh, and to adapted that for online. So I will bring students into groups in the classroom. These would be groups, of course, scattered around the room on uh, zoom. It would be students in separate breakout rooms and each group is given a slide and uh, their slide includes a link to a database of digitized, uh, digitized primary sources. So each group is asked to do some searching. Um, we've developed, we had developed a list of keywords prior to going into the breakout rooms. So students have some keywords to use in their searching and they're asked to provide a screenshot of a primary source that they found in the database. And just to make the slide a little easier to read, I didn't provide the answers to um, the questions that students were asked to provide about the database, but uh, I asked students to think of, uh, provide a search tip for their classmates. So for instance, um, not the rest of the groups are searching a different database. What should they tell their classmates about and would their student, their classmates want to search this database and what might be some potential limitations. Uh, so, for instance, uh, one group um, uh, was searching the NWCP papers in a class and they made a really great point that this would be a really great resource to look at if they wanted to have a supplement to legal documents that they had found. And one thing that is really wonderful about this activity with the slides is that every group gets a chance to uh, uh, to search a specific database. They get that hands on searching experience. Uh, and then we, of course, they don't have time to look at uh, every database that might be relevant to their class, but their classmates will be presenting on other relevant databases. So we reconvene as a class. Each group presents uh, very briefly on the database that they searched and students after that day have access to the slides as a resource. So uh, if they if they had searched the public health archives and uh, want to go search the NAACP papers based on the 
uh, the advice of their classmates, they have, they can refer to those slides as well. And uh, this has worked really well with classes um, as a way for students to get engaged. Uh, and also the, um, uh, the professor whose class is represented by this particular slide, she has told me multiple times that she loves this approach so much that she's actually adapted the approach that I've used um, in her course throughout the semester in her meetings with students. So that was really rewarding to hear. Uh, and as discussed earlier, one of our Ithaca themes related to representation of marginalized voices within readily available primary sources. So uh, something that we really are very uh, thought, uh, try to be really thoughtful and intentional about is in any of our class sessions, really addressing this in our teaching. Uh, so, for instance, and it's been really rewarding to see that uh, if we spend time talking about whose voices are represented in a collection, students really get very engaged and want to think critically about this. Uh, so, for example, on the slide I'd had earlier um, uh, where students were evaluating a database of digitized primary sources, one of the questions they're asked is, what is the limitation of this database? And very often the limitation that students bring up is related to representation. So it's really great to see that students are engaged with that discussion we have in class. And then they're applying that critical analysis when they're looking at primary sources. And the example I have here was an example of a class uh, where I was, uh, I was given the opportunity to assign homework to the students. Uh, and the professor had originally said, uh, would you like to assign a reading? And I thought, why not give students a little break from reading? And I had asked the class to listen to uh, a radio program from, I think it was two years ago. Um, oh yeah, two, 2019. It is, uh, the program is under the radar. And uh, on this program, uh, there were panelists talking about returning the African American experience to history's archives. So the students were asked to read to listen to this prior to class, and then we kicked off class talking about the program. It was a really rich discussion. Uh, the professor hadn't listened to the program previously, but uh, he learned some really interesting things that he talked about with the class uh, that he was going to apply in his own work. And uh, then as we moved on to searching in some databases and generating key keywords and talking about search strategies, students really had this, um, were thinking, had this foundation where they were thinking really critically about representation as we made our way through the databases. So as we think ahead to the return to more in-person teaching, we're really thinking about how can we make the most of these digital teaching skills that we've all been developing over the past year, while also engaging faculty and their students with that in-person experiential aspect of bringing a class to the archives. Uh, we're really so pleased with how well teaching uh, remotely has gone in so many cases. We've been able to be really creative and come up with ways to engage students. And as, faculty, as Chloe talked about, we've even had faculty who had not previously worked with the archives in person, integrating uh, visits with the virtual visits of the archives into their teaching. Uh, but at the same time, we think back to those conversations that we had with faculty in the Ithaca interviews and to some of the things that they talked about regarding the power of a virtual, of a physical visit to the archives. For example, one historian talked about bringing his class to the archives to look at uh, materials related to Leo Frank, who was a victim of lynching in the early 20th century. And he talked about it's there's something very exciting for students about holding a physical do, uh, holding a document. So touching a document that Leo Frank touched has a power that the online surrogate does not. Laura, I think we've lost your audio and I don't know if you're hearing us or not. Um, Chloe, are you, are you able to unmute?
Is anybody hearing me? I hear you, Marilee. Okay. Uh, great. Um, let's see. I don't know if we've lost Laura or if we can get her back. Uh, let me let me just uh, send a chat message to her. Okay, um, let's see, while we're working on this, uh, hmm, yeah, Chloe, are you, are you able to unmute and speak maybe while we're working on getting uh, Laura's audio back? Um, we could ask, a, we could pose a couple of questions to you if you're still with us. Uh, you are on mute at the moment. Okay, Chloe, I'm going to unmute you. Chloe, can you hear us? Chloe? Yes, I can't I can't unmute. Oh, you're unmuted right now. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> My uh, computer screen shows that I'm still muted. Okay. Well, uh, we can hear you now, although you seem to have dropped off. Um, are you still with us? Yes. Can you okay. still hear me? We can still hear you. Um, I'm oh, not great. sure that my, you're still. Okay, that's great. My, uh, <laughs> my chat just disappeared. Okay. Um, so, um, yes, uh, Laura, I think left off about, um, bringing classes into the archives and yeah. um, working together. So we have a first year experience program that I think a lot of other schools do. And so Laura and I work together to um, put together um, a list of different things that um, the archives have that would match up to different classes from the first year experience program and different kinds of active learning exercises that we could do with the professors. Um, we had also thought about coming together to help faculty form communities of practice because we had found during our study that a lot of faculty didn't actually share their ideas with their colleagues. Um, so we thought that might be a really nice thing for faculty to be able to take part in and to be able to talk to one another about what they're doing and learn from each other and kind of have a nice group going. The other thing that we had talked about, and Laura can actually talk about this more when her microphone works, is they have a um, digital certificate program for grad students that has been part of the library since before the pandemic. And it's been incredibly popular, and I believe they've had more people apply to it than they've been able to accept. So that's been really nice um, that this is something that we can offer. So we are hoping to offer a Teaching with Primary Sources Certificate program kind of similar to that for our grad students. Can everyone still hear me? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I know. It's kind of a weird situation. I, I advance to the next uh, slide, which says um, citations. Oh, I can't see that. All right. Okay. So this slide, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Mine says automatically reconnecting over and over again. You're doing so great. This, <laughs> this slide is a citation for, I believe, the Right Question Institute. Um, they are based out of Cambridge, I believe. So um, you can go check out more about their program. It's really wonderful. It's a great thing to use and I mean, we've used it in a, so many different classes and it's always been really successful for the students. Um, and this also, the second part is a citation for their book, which I believe Laura is a bestseller from Harvard Education Press. So this is, um, the next slide is actually questions. So we are happy to answer any questions. 
that anybody might have. I lost the chat, so. That's no, that. no problem whatsoever. Uh, we do have a couple of questions and I think Chayla is going to feel those. And I think that Laura is just reconnecting. So this is oh, a perfect fabulous. time to come back to questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. And thank you for handling that so beautifully, Chloe. Yeah, thank no you problem. for jumping in, Sorry. Chloe. We doubled through that. No. Sorry, I think our network <laughs> went down on campus. Uh, I apologize about that. Um, no problem. I think uh, Laura, Chloe was able to jump in and sort of wrap things up and we have uh, moved on to, I think we're ready to, to go to questions and we have a couple of questions from chat. So, um, so I'll go ahead and, and ask some of those. And if others have questions, please feel free uh, to put them in the chat and we'll, we will read them uh, into the recording and, and get answers for you. Um, so we'll start, uh, Gordon uh, Danes at BYU asked, um, what do you cover in your in-depth archival research workshop and how long is that workshop? Wow. So all of the workshops we did are half an hour. We figured that was um, a solid chunk of time that we could get a foundation for. And we always leave um, buffer time for an extra half hour if anybody wants to stay, which for every single workshop we've given this year, we have always had at least one person stay for at least half an hour. Um, so in the in-depth research one, we give a little bit of an overview of, you know, what is an archives, what is usually contained in them, different types of archives, um, you know, how to access an archives. So even though they're usually all different and have slightly different rules, the kind of entry point is usually the same where you know, talking to the archivist is your best first step. And we also go into what finding aids are and give a little um, breakdown of some of, the, um, some of the different components. And then we also have a couple slides about um, what to think about in terms of what is not always part of an archive um, or part of a collection where, um, you know, of, say for correspondence, for example, if you had a collection that was of me and I had tons of letters that Laura had written me, odds are my letters back to Laura would be missing. Um, so we talked to students about, you know, where to, where to find materials that can potentially fill in that missing, that missing component. You know, how do you find complementary collections? And we also have tips on um, going to archives around the world. Since a lot of our students get grants and go off and study in France and um, Spain and different areas, you know, just different types of information about um, things to think about. You know, is a collection actually on site? In government collections, uh, or sorry, in government archives, are the collections in one building or spread out? Um, are they open during the summer? <laughs> you know, where are they exactly? Things like that. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, Christy Lutz asks um, uh, also about the workshops. Um, these are wonderful ideas that I'm that I'm going to steal. <laughs> um, thank you. Do you, Please feel free. <laughs> <laughs> how do you advertise the workshops to faculty and students and others? Honestly, that is a lot of in part due to help from Laura um, and the library team. So our outreach and special projects um, archivist does advertise them through our different social media channels, but they're also um, they're also displayed along and advertised with every other library workshop. So I think that's gotten a, a lot of um, a lot of attendees as well. Um, I we've partnered with a CTL, our Center for Teaching and Learning to have them advertise it. We've talked to faculty about it. Um, so pretty much any way we possibly can. But also please feel free to steal any idea because that is what teaching is about, is kind of adapting things. And uh, hey, Laura, I guess- do you have- yeah, oh. um, so the Brandeis History Workshop, we had originally been thinking like, oh, incoming first years would be interested. So we worked with the Department of Orientation to advertise it to them, and to those students. And um, actually it was kind of funny that that was where um, 
uh, some parents of students were like, I want to attend too, which we hadn't anticipated, but was a really nice, um, you know, connection to make and really important outreach as well. And uh, we have uh, liaison newsletters that we send out um, about monthly to faculty in various departments. And while we advertise like all the workshops, we definitely do highlight workshops that are going to be of more interest to people in that department. So, uh, prime the the archives workshops to faculty in the humanities and social sciences, whereas we might emphasize the data analysis ones a little bit more in um, some of the social sciences and sciences. Um, and we also do have, um, and we have a first year student newsletter that is through our personal librarian program. Uh, so we advertise there and then we have an opt in student newsletter and or actually anyone on campus newsletter and uh, while at first we didn't necessarily have a lot of people signing up because they might not hear about it, we've actually added a question to our workshops form. Um, do you want to sign up for our newsletter here about more workshops? And uh, we have gotten a lot more people signed up for that opt-in newsletter through that um, method. Smart. Um, so I have a question. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the communities of practice that uh, with the, with the, the faculty and, um, and sort of what, what your involvement or not <laughs> is in that, like, are you offering training to them? Are you a part of that group? Or is that just an ongoing sort of community of practice for faculty uh, sort of separate from the library? So I apologize if any uh, any part of community, I think that was right around the time I dropped off. Uh, that's more of like a something that we are planning to do because um, we okay. think there would be some value in like sort of bringing people together where we can. Uh, but we've seen in other instances that um, our communities of practice run through our Center for Teaching and Learning have had really robust discussions around things like scholarship of teaching and learning, SOTL, uh, and um, and I, we work really closely with our um, Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, so we, uh, and actually we're co-located with them um, uh, here in the library. Their, their offices are in the same area that the uh, research librarian offices are. Uh, so that's more of like something that we are definitely planning to do. And uh, uh, just uh, that's sort of uh, a little further down the road, but we think it would be a really rich way to engage people. Um, one community of practice has been really robust this year was um, a group of faculty actually from all different departments who um, uh, are all teaching classes that are fully online to international students who weren't able to come to the US this year. Uh, so that group of faculty has met throughout the year and a library staff member um, uh, attends each of those meetings and it's just one of like, it's just really great to see the types of topics that come up, come up when you bring together a group of people who have a shared interest, but might not cross paths otherwise. That's great. Yeah, it sounds like a, a very smart idea. So I'll be curious to hear how it goes. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. And our, our director of our Center for Teaching and Learning has a background in art history. So I think she, you know, she really um, gets really excited by um, ideas about collaborations with the archives as well. Uh, so we're really lucky to have her as a partner. That's awesome. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat and we're almost at the top of the hour. So I think maybe this is a good place to wrap it up. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Marilee. Yes, indeed. Thank you. There was um, one question that came uh, about um, the recording and slides being made available. Yes, they will be made available. Um, for everybody who's registered for the webinar, you will be getting um, an email uh, notifying you when that's um, when that's available on our website. I want to thank you all for joining us today. A special, special thanks to uh, Chloe and Laura for dealing with the um, technical goblins. Uh, my goodness, we are so reliant on these steady internet connections and when they go away, that's just uh, really, really disorienting. So, so thank you both for handling that with such grace. Um, we also appreciate the audience participation. Um, I know that the ACRL virtual conference is going on right now, and that's um, calling to a lot of people with, uh, with teaching responsibilities. So appreciate you uh, spending some time here with us today. Um, so we will post a recording of this webinar online and let you know when that's available. And I wanna thank you once again for joining us today. And this concludes today's webinar. Thank you all so much.